Thank you, and thanks for coming. And if anybody wants to join the Society of King Charles I, King and Martyr, talk with me afterwards, please. Um, I've been trying to get St. Olaf to actually um, do a great ceremony on the anniversary of his death, but I won't take up any time on that. Um, yeah, we, did, we thought, Stephen and I, to, the, speaking about um, Jesus Christ, yeah, yeah, that that might be um, somebody that um, might be relevant for Christian philosophy. So uh, what I thought I would do is highlight um, a kind of seven features of, uh, that stem out of a, a meditation on Jesus Christ as represented in Christian faith. That's um, meditation as in Descartes without the evil demon, and no yoga, but maybe we'll do some deep breathing, I hope. And um, I'm going to be assuming, in terms of Christian faith, essential, the essential reliability of the New Testament, if not ipsissima vox, uh, ipsissima verbum, Ipsissum of Vox, and I'll assume the Apostles' Creed, uh, Nicene Creed, and Council, Chalcedon. And what I'll be trying to do is indicate seven areas where uh, Christian philosophers haven't concentrated very much in terms of the, of the sacred and that the activity of hallowing or making something holy through the process of dedication. And I'm going to begin with the notion of um, personhood. Excuse me, excuse me for one second. Oh, so good. I'll take little breaks here and there. But I, I begin with personhood because in some respects, this is a place where so-called analytic and continental philosophers diverge. And also Thomists and contemporary Christian philosophers who have been associated with the SCP, like Al Planica and others. And others. Um, Brian Davies, for example, distinguishes between uh, what he calls person theism or personal theism versus what he uh, owns as the classical tradition. Uh, for Davies, speaking of God as a person uh, makes sense, or of three persons in a theological sense, but he's not going to use the terms of personhood, like acting intentionally and knowingly, um, of the divine in a way that would indicate that um, he's uh, subscribing to the personhood of God. So I'm gonna be, I begin with personhood and with this claim, and that is it's very difficult to uh, take seriously the, this, this creedal Christian background and, and the New Testament without taking very, very seriously the primacy or the ineliminability and the good of being a person. Now, that might sound pretty thin, but it really has been at the heart of so many important movements in the 20th century. Um, our, the gentleman who just spoke here was referencing Boston personalism, which was actually a very important mo movement that took the personhood of God seriously. And it did translate into a real civic action. For example, Martin Luther King Jr. was a, a student of Boston personalism. So I begin by suggesting, in terms of the sacred, that which is set apart, and that which in our case, when we dedicate ourselves to the divine as persons, your, your life and the way um, you are in the world over time, diachronically, but also the way certain periods of your life can be made sacred to God. I'm actually going to creep up on the topic of aging. It's become fascinating. <laughs> Suddenly every day it becomes more interesting. And, <laughs> and also uh, dying. I've, I've really, I started reading about how to die uh, when I turned 30, because I thought any day now. And so I'm going to d discuss how you can die well. I call it dying well, rather than die hard something like that. So the first thing is, uh, I would say Brian Davies is correct that by his lights, the, the topic or the theme of the personhood of God became to, came to the fore in the 19th century, but that was largely because of the, of the wake of the Industrial Revolution. That was largely because the impersonal categories of the economies of the time were eating up individuals. 
and it was also because of the rise of Marxism. Uh, Marx has the ultimate kind of relational understanding of persons without persons. The early Marx does have individuals, but after, um, let's say, 1864, I think, um, he has the person as an ensemble of social relations. So he, in a sense, he kind of loses sight of the individual. So, um, oh, I have an anecdote. I'm not going, I'm going to resist it. No, I can't. <laughs> okay, perhaps you're familiar with Dale Tuggy's work on the Trinity. And he has a uh, parable where he uh, it indicates what he regards as it's an argument from deception. And the, the thesis is that God in the Hebrew Bible, Christian Old Testament, is portrayed as one. And yet, when it becomes revealed, uh, that God is three, this is a real betrayal. And he has a story about Annie, who uh, is um, assisted by Frank, whom she never sees, but actually consists of three individual people who actually call themselves just one person. So she feels very betrayed. And my students this term, about 12 of them got together, and they blended all their faces into this one person and they gave a name that was an anagram of all their names together. I think it was Sebastian. And they actually tried to befriend another student. So this group of 12 was kind of giving them gifts from Sebastian. And so, and at the end of this exercise, they asked whether he felt betrayed. Because, you know, this Sebastian was actually 12 people. And he, they just had a good time. I, that's all I can say. I mean, <laughs> I mean, how many times do you do real experiments in, in philosophy of religion? I mean, that's a real experiment, and I can send you the results. Okay. The next thing about uh, the person of Jesus Christ as we philosophically meditate on the, its significance is it brings to light what I would call um, the virtues and the hallowing of embodiment. Now, by virtue here, I mean a non-moral good. So it seems to me, and I suggest to you, that we, we not only are able to speak, to, to feel, to have senses, and so on, but we, are to have, we have the goodness of feeling, the goodness, the power of all of these abilities. And this, is, this comes out very clearly in the New Testament of Jesus' healing, often, of the restoring of sight and, and of mobility. So I would like to make two points here. One is that um, I think the contemporary understanding of embodiment that we have in both secular and religious philosophical quarters seems to me very positivistic in a juridical fashion. That is, the, um, the positivists in, in law separate the concept of law from its goodness. Okay? And I think that's what's happened in philosophy. That If you read Kim, Sosa, um, Searle, any number of persons, Rarely is it made explicit that embodiment is something good, okay? So I think that's an important point that should come out of a uh, Christian meditation on the embodied personhood of Christ. And the hallowing of these things is when you dedicate some part of yourself or your whole self to God. And what dedication consists of in a religious context is the taking of something good and making it as, as a self-offering to another. So if we go just between us, and let's say you write a book and you dedicate it to your parents, friends, or to me, uh, why not do that? Um, in a sense, this uh, involves, first it's gotta be a good book. <laughs> I mean, who knows whether Descartes really meant to dedicate the meditations to the faculty at the Sorbonne, at the Paris, uh, the theology faculty. But it has to be good, and in some ways, its goodness is increased as it's given. So if you wrote the book, you're dedicating it to your professor, in some ways, you as the giver undertake a certain amount of self-restraint because it's no, longer your, it's no longer a possessory good only of yours. Rather, you're offering it to someone else. And in a sense, the one to whom it's given is enhanced in some way, perhaps in terms of reputation, but not in an 
uh, egomaniac fashion, I hope. <laughs> um, I, I, I suppose I was drawn to this because probably the worst reception I ever had philosophically ever was the C.S. Lewis Society in Oxford. Um, one person in the back said, let's get the American. And um, so when I, it was terrible. Oh, uh, a couple of pints helped. But, and what, what really helped was writing a book on C.S. Lewis and prayer and then dedicating it to the, the Oxford C.S. Lewis Society and to thank them for their really kind hospitality. That was sarcastic, but really true, and, and very helpful, I recommend it. Um, in any case, there's a sense in which, with, in the Godhead, there's an enhancement that perhaps can be brought out with one true story uh, really quick, is that a friend of mine was uh, dealing with the remains, the, the, the um, mementos from World War I as a British officer who was wounded in the Battle of the Somme. And he was showing me these late at night in Minneapolis. Uh, this included um, his regimental uh, stripes and a bag with uh, some remains, and it had blood on it. I could tell it was by smelt it. And, and in a moment, John, my friend, gave it to me. He said, this is for you. And I decided to take it. And then I returned it to him. Because I knew he had two sons. Those are the ones that should, be, that should have that. But I think that by accepting it and then returning it, it had greater, at least our friendship was enhanced. Are you with me on that? Do you, I mean, I just understand. So I think that dedica dedicating, well, it can be done in a very sarky way, which I did. Um, when genuine, there can be an enhancement of the good. Um, I'd like to, you know, if I've got seven of these, how long is this going to take? You're probably thinking I'll be moving swiftly through them. But I, I do want to pause on one point that was made earlier, and that was in thinking of God as a uh, person without a body or a disembodied person or disincarnate. And I would suggest that while I'm you know, focusing in on the good of embodiment, and even it's being hallowed when it's dedicated to the divine, thus becoming sacred or set apart. Um, the, the, the reference to the Godhead as disembodied, it seems to me not, well, conceptually confused or inappropriate. That is, it suggests that God is, um, in, disembodiment is an impairment in some, in some sense. At least that's the way I would read it. Someone is disincarnate. There's no carne, there's no flesh. And it's, it strikes me, if one needs a term, uh, I would say incorporeal would be less misleading in the sense that according to a lot of Christian tradition, uh, the soul of a, of a creature is actually incorporeal. So being incorporeal is neutral towards being embodied or disembodied. So I now move to the self-diffusive goodness of the incarnation. I've decided to skip it. What, <laughs> what I do have, however, is a massive handout. And a John has them, but don't distribute it yet, that if I'm still alive, he's instructed to pass it out to everybody. Will there be a development of an objection to the incarnation because it is, um, well, maybe I should read the objection. And then that might motivate you to read the response. Yeah, okay, this is the objection from Freya Matthews. Quote, um, well, she's developing an objection against Judaism, but it would work equally well against Christianity. Uh, so she's thinking about Judaism and God and uh, theology in terms of a family. Think of an analogous situation in a family. A father overwhelms his firstborn with love and insists on pain of obliteration that his love is returned. Other children are born into the family and the father is much more easygoing with them, inviting them into his affections 
rather than co-opting them, as he did the firstborn. But he maintains an especially intense and special relationship um, with uh, the firstborn. And how would the other children not feel like second-class uh, children and be given over to envy and jealousy and so on? What I've sought to do is to give a different parable that would indica indicate more appropriately a Christian understanding of the Incarnation or a Jewish understanding of God's chosen people. And in, in a sense, maybe building on some of the terminology I'm trying to invite here, namely the terminology of hallowing, that is making holy through dedication, there's a sense in which the Incarnation can be understood as God in Christ, I'm not an adoptionist, uh, making a self-offering, but this also reflects the self-offering of the Godhead as dedicated in a self-diffusive way towards bringing the good of the incarnation to others. Okay? In, so it's not so much that we should picture in the Christian theological narrative the idea that we are only envious and jealous until we came across the Hebrew people and suddenly, oh my heavens, they have an exclusive relationship with Yahweh. No. Um, rather, I think a more accurate kind of tapestry or thought experiment would be we are in envy and jealousy and so on. And then what you have is something like the uh, teachings of the Hebrew people and the, the um, revelation of God as self-offering. This actually anticipates uh, my fifth point, And um, I think I'm going to then make this now. Um, and that is that the revelation, as understood in, in, quote, the Old Testament, is actually almost always, it seems to me, understood in terms of biblical writers and subsequent um, Jewish tradition as God working through the least likely means uh, in terms of reaching the world. So it's not as though... Um, I mean, from a secular point of view, the history of Israel compared to Egypt and the Hittites and the Assyrians and the Babylonians, the Persians, it's a blip on the screen. And in the uh, revelation of God, you have God revealed through a burning bush, you know, this insignificant plant. And there's a sense in which, strewn through um, salvation history in the Christian narrative, uh, is an affirmation that God often works through the younger brother, and through the, um, through the, what is the word I want? The barren uh, female, that is, it's the woman who is not coming forth with children who is then blessed. Sarah is blessed in old age. Um, Cain and Abel, who was the bad one? Was it the older brother? I think so. Uh, Jacob and Esau, uh, Joseph and his brothers. It's, uh, David was the younger brother, Solomon was the younger brother. Uh, it's often in salvation history, it's understood that uh, God works through these uh, not arrogant ways of, of this is the one, but rather it's, it's a matter of the world, as it were, denigrating certain people, to become marginalized. And then the Christian teaching is that those are the ones that God chose to reveal and to kind of unmask um, the, the um, appalling... Uh, nature of um, irascible power, imperial power. Now, I'm going to tie this in with the notion of um, also making sacred. Another thing we can learn about philosophically, I think, from meditating on the person of Jesus Christ, is the good or virtue of birth, ancestral, her hereditary, and family, but each of those have to be subordinate to fidelity. And it, any concept of the good of birth has to also be accompanied by the good of adoption. I think that Christianity, of all religions, should have the highest view of adoption of any of the faiths. Um, so first I begin with birth. So we do not have, in matters of um, theophanies or epiphanies or um, manifest manifestations of Krishna, uh, when, when you have an... Um, an avatar, it's not the case in, the, say, the Bhagavad Gita that Krishna had a birth, that he's going to die, that he's flesh and blood, that he can bleed, and so on. So it seems to me that 
Christianity fundamentally in the birth narratives affirms the goodness of biological birth. Jesus' uh, genealogy is represented twice in uh, the New Testament. So this, this seems to me to represent a good. It's also fascinating to look at uh, who is in the genealogy as a point of redemption. For example, um, it's listed as one of his ancestors, the, um, hus is it the husband of, oh no, the wife of, Beth of, the wife of Uriah. So the name Bathsheba is not mentioned. So it's, it's very interesting with the lessons there. So I think heredity is um, recognized as a good, but in the Christian uh, narrative, one understands, especially for Gentile Christians, is that you're adopted into the family of God. And the language of the family of God, you'll find it in quite a few of the catechisms of the different branches of the church. For example, in the, in the current uh, Roman Catholic first page of the catechism, it indicates that we are called into the family of God. So um, I think that meditating on Christ gives us a new look at birth and family relations, including uh, siblings. So we find Christ saying, well, who are my, who's my brother? Who's my mother? And it's the one who believes, uh, the one who is faithful, the one who is, has fidelity, who is the true brother. And I, I, I'm going to just say one personal thing, that this has been the, one of the more liberating parts of my own uh, Christian journey. I was uh, hated by two of my brothers my whole life, two of my half-brothers absolutely hated. And it, why? Because I was born. That was what they both said. And for me to find in the notion of the fraternity of, that's offered in Christ, you do have a picture of a true brother, what that amounts to. Um, now, I want to, um, let's see, highlight, okay, just three more virtues, I think, that comes to us through meditating on the person of Christ. And one is the good of abiding in God, or abiding in Christ, and Christ abiding in us. And this seems to me to be very well articulated in an article that's not very well known by William Alston on the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It was actually criticized uh, at a um, APA um, memorial service celebrating Alston's life. As typical of philosophers, you know. Yeah, he was a great philosopher, but he was mistaken here. Um, <laughs> so, I don't know. I'll just um, grin and bear it. Uh, but one thing that emerges for me as I meditate on the person of Christ and his use of everything from sleep to um, fasting and so on is this notion of this, what I think is available to all of us, is an experiential acquaintance with the divine. And this being a celebration and part of um, Alvin Plantinga's work, I thought I would suggest the way um, Al and uh, Thomas Nagel uh, are so close in many respects. And one of the things that Nagel could do would be with, <laughs> he could use a better example of a religious experience than the one he offered in his review of Al's book in um, the New York Review of Books. Let me read Nagel for a second, and I'll get back to you. Your call is important to us. <laughs> okay. I'm desperate. <laughs> so um, Nagel writes, it is illuminating to have the starkness of the opposition between Plantinga's theism and the secular outlook so clearly explained, that is explained by Al. Oh. My insensitively Oh, no, my instinctively atheistic per perspective implies that if I ever found myself flooded with the conviction that what the Nicene Creed says is true, the most likely explanation would be that I was losing my mind, not that I was being granted the gift of faith. From Plantinga's point of view, by contrast, I suffer from some kind of spiritual blindness from whom I am unwilling to be cured. This is a huge epistemological gulf and it cannot be overcome um, by cooperative employment of cognitive faculties. Well, I, absolutely he should go and commit himself. If he's suddenly just walking along and out of the blue thinks, um, 
the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, begotten before all worlds. Um, and the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son. And the Father, is, together with the Father and the Son, is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. I mean, no way you could get, I mean, if that suddenly occurred to you and you had no preparatory work, you know, it's, yeah, you're mad, you're crazy. <laughs> so uh, what I have is, actually, I've written a narrative for Thomas Nagel. And so you'll see that in the handout. That gives you a little more access. Okay, so now I get to, oh, this is really good, but I should, I should wind up. But the, net, the last good I wish to highlight is the good of glory. Of, and I want to contrast Christian glory and pagan glory and how this leads towards this concept of um, holy dying and uh, a little bit more on aging. In Greek, in the Homeric world, glory, or kleos, is the term that's used, it was often uh, an, a, a um, no-win situation. It was such that only, there was only going to be one victor. Kleos was typically won on the field of battle in aristocratic violence, in the sense that the Iliad, it's the people that are named who, who come into conflict with each other. There's a ritual cursing. And, uh, and the like. And what glory has achieved, what, and glory here would be um, to be worthy of um, awe, fear, power, danger, uh, almost as close as you can get to the numinous in a, in a sense, but in, in a way that's, uh, that's non-moral. Okay? It's not necessarily moral. It could be, but it, it doesn't have to be. And in Homer, uh, there's one exception here, but Kleos is sometimes used very literally of the armor that you hold up of the person you vanquished. So the blood on the armor, that's glory, the physical thing, the booty, essentially. And for the, uh, that notion of glory, I think, has cer certainly survived into, quote, the Christian era. Uh, something like the Song of Roland is pretty pagan and Homeric, uh, where you have, again, victory is won on the field of battle and so on. But in Christ, you have a reversal of pagan glory, because in the case of Christ, Christ bleeds, and yet it's his blood that makes people healed, okay? That is, that's the glory. It's completely inverted in that sense. And what also is opened up, it seems to me, is the notion that there can be either eternal or everlasting glory of the creature through participation in the divine, now, how does that work? Well, it s seems to me that if um, the view of the Trinity is right, namely the one I hold, uh, the, um, basically I, I go with a social understanding of the Trinity in which the interior glory of God is manifested in the shared love between God the Father and the Son, the love of the self-love, love of another, and the love of two for a third. This kind of extraordinary, everlasting, or eternal sharing of ecstatic joy and the like. And, and the external glory of God, as understood by you know, Jonathan Edwards, some of the Cappadocians and, and the like, this is where you or we, we as creatures can, as it were, reflect or participate in the interior glory of God so that when you truly love another person, and um, an example I sometimes use is between Coleridge and Wordsworth, when they had sufficient love for themselves, each, like Coleridge actually loved himself, uh, and they loved each other, they naturally loved the third thing, the English language. And you had this amazing um, romantic um, literature. But it was when they lost self-love, and when they think each of them lost love of the other, that their poetry came down. And I would say, when Coleridge through his own inability to get um, uh, any kind of control over his life and um, his opium usage and so on. So I'd say when you love another person and you, that love draws you to more love, there's a sense in which you are participating or mirroring the inter interior glory of God. You are in a way participating in it even without knowing it. And so that I think is, is a principal point that... Um, Christ calls us to. Now, I'm going to end with this uh, other follow-up 
and that is, I believe that um, our chronological age needs to be subordinate to what I'm calling axial age. I'm sort of stealing this from Carl Jaspers. You know, he had this idea of the axial ages, you know, which is this period when you have from Confucius on up through Buddha. He, he didn't include Jesus there. <laughs> um, anyway, um, but I think that age needs to be understood as subordinate to uh, what is valuable, what is valuable to you, what is, and what is truly valuable over, all, all told. And what I'm led to believe is that the effort by some secular naturalists, I have in mind particularly Simon Blackburn and Philip Kitcher, that their effort to try to only affirm the meaningfulness of love, even of two persons and meaningful life, in a world in which, which ends in oblivion is unsuccessful or it falls short of something really vital that is provided in the picture of the glory of God that I think comes out through this meditation of Jesus. And um, I'll bring this home then by, I think I'll just cite Blackburn. So in this passage, he is dismissing the idea that you need to find meaning in anything transcendent. He goes, but there's another option for meaning, which is to look only within life itself. This is the imminent option. It is content with the everyday. There is sufficient meaning for human beings in the human world, the world of familiar and even humdrum doings and experiences. In the imminent option, the smile of the baby, the grace of the dancer, the sound of voices, the movements of a lover give meaning to life. For some, it is activity and achievement, gaining the summit of a mountain, crossing the finish line first, finding the cure, writing the poem. These, last, these things last only for their short time, but that does not deny them meaning. A smile does not need to go on forever in order to mean what it does. There is nothing beyond or apart from the processes of life. Furthermore, there is no one goal to which all processes tend. Now, on the surface, this seems quite sensible. Uh, but if you consider a thought experiment, imagine uh, the, you love this um, smiling um, baby, this, uh, the child. Actually, Blackburn refers to you love the smile of the baby, not to the he doesn't, maybe he loves the smile, but not the baby. I'm not sure. But if you imagine, let's say, two realities. Reality one, um, the smiling baby, let's call her Mary, lives to become a graceful dancer. And I'm just going to tie together all the traits that Blackburn has. She's a dancer who sings in a wonderful choir. She has a loving and intimate partner with whom she enjoys climbing mountains making love, I just added that for your benefit, and competing in sports. And she also finds time to discover cures for diseases and to write poetry. At death, Mary perishes everlastingly, as does her partner and all those who loved and enjoyed her. They're gone. Uh, and also for Blackburn, certainly for Kitcher, I'm not sure about Blackburn, but actually uh, Kitcher, who ties his concept of truth to um, social linguistic practices. Once social linguistic practices are gone, so's truth. So even the thesis that it was true that this person, Mary, lived a beautiful life, it wouldn't be true anymore on his view. Now I think he should just add a little Platonism there and he could get up by with some of that, but on his view, he says, isn't that meaning enough? Well, it's no longer going to be true. Not only, so you can't, um, anyway, I'm getting hysterical. Okay, reality two. The smiling baby Mary grows up to become a graceful dancer who sings in a wonderful choir. She has a loving, intimate partner and everything else, exactly as before. However, the time, the cos this time, the cosmos has been created and is sustained in being by the living one who calls everyone to a life of compassion, justice, reconciliation, and joyful worship. This loving, powerful, God acts to offer redemption to Mary and all persons through calling them to renounce evil and sin and come into a great, fulfilling, loving union with, the, with God in a life beyond this life. Now, if you believe that that's metaphysically preposterous, then 
e even perhaps wishing it were true would be futile. But unless you know <laughs> it's to be preposterous, I guess I would ask, what sort of person would hope it's preposterous, especially if you love this person? And it strikes me that truly loving a person invites us to wish for this much greater axial um, fulfillment at death. I personally think that the secular world has yet to take seriously uh, the implications of the denial of an individual afterlife. First, there's very little appreciation for what belief in an individual afterlife meant culturally and historically. For one thing, it actually meant the improved treatment of children in many cultures, such as uh, Egypt, for example. Uh, those that believed in, in a dynamic individual life in, in Islam, uh, w what did that lead to? Uh, in some respects, its good was manifested in the fact that in tribal identity, the head of your tribe was not your absolute judge. In other words, there was another judge you, you and your tribal leader had to face. So first of all, believing in an individual dynamic afterlife that's diachronic, that has continuity, it has had important effects in the pa past. And I think giving it up is, is quite interesting. Um, a recent book by Samuel Scheffler, an uh, atheist, he uh, does a thought experiment in which all of life, uh, human life, ceases, either through failure to reproduce or um, some cat cataclysmic event. And he proposes that our grasp of meaning, the meaning of even having lunch with somebody, would be, would, this would cast a shadow over all such things. So I think uh, what I'm suggesting to you is this meditation on the, the person of Christ and uh, notions of hallowing, making sacred, participating, and so on bring to light goods that are often neglected by secular philosophers. And I commend, let's do some more meditating. Thank you very much.